Good evening and welcome to MissMass. My name is Brian Boyles. I serve as Executive Director of Mass Humanities and we're so glad to have you here for the third installment in this series, a partnership between Mass Humanities and the Mississippi Humanities Council. I want to especially thank those of you who are facing challenges with the weather in the South. We know that there are power outages and boil advisories in parts of Mississippi and our thoughts are certainly with the friends that couldn't make it tonight as well as everyone in the South that's facing these issues. I hope you are well and that things warm up soon. Since December, uh, we've worked to connect people from these two states to build a bridge in a time of great division. To do that, we rely on a newly minted tool of our democracy, the Zoom breakout room. And my colleague at the Mississippi Humanities Council, Caroline Gillespie, is gonna give you a quick tutorial on how to get things started tonight. Hi everybody, my name is Caroline Gillespie. I'm program officer with the Mississippi Humanities Council and welcome to the third installment of Miss Mass. We are so glad to see all of your faces and especially glad to see our Mississippi friends despite this horrible winter weather. Um, so thank you all to making, for making the effort to be here tonight, uh, especially considering how timely a conversation about water is right now. Um, for so many reasons. Um, before I go over a couple of housekeeping things, I just want to say a huge thank you to Brian Boyles, uh, who you just heard from, who has worked on this program uh, with me and for all of his uh, time and effort that he's put into it. Um, thanks also to our panelists, who you'll hear from in a little bit, and also to the rest of the MHC staff who has helped uh, do a lot of <laughs> extra uh lifting for this program since we're all kind of managing with various levels of power and internet and everything. Um, so just a couple of housekeeping things to go over. If you haven't already done so, please take a minute um, to change your name. Um, we wanna make sure we know where everybody's from so that we can kind of get a sense for who's joining us. It will also make things easier as we're moving people into breakout rooms. Um, so we've just put in the chat, if you'll open up the chat on your screen, um, there are specific instructions for how to change your name. Um, if you're on a computer, all you need to do is enter or hover over the bottom of your screen, uh, click on participants, uh, go to your name and uh, click more and then rename. So you can rename yourself. So just put an MS or an MA or whatever, whatever state you're joining us from um, in front of your name and that'll help us throughout the night. Um, if you're on a phone, uh, click on your screen, then go to participants, then on your name and then done once you're finished. Um, if you have any trouble with that, don't worry, somebody will, will show up shortly to help you figure it out. Um, if you're not already muted, please take a second to mute yourself now. It's in the bottom left-hand screen. Um, there will be plenty of chances for you to talk throughout the night, but this is just so we can kind of focus on our speakers for the next little bit. Um, and then if you'd like to change your settings so that you um, only see the speakers who are talking instead of the entire group, if you go up to the upper right hand corner of your screen, you can change from what's probably on gallery view to speaker view, and then that will kind of highlight whoever's speaking and make it easier for you um, to know exactly who's talking. Um, I will hand it back to Brian. Um, again, if y'all have any trouble, just drop into the chat um, your name and where you're from or whatever question you have, and somebody will be able to help you. Thanks, Caroline, and thanks for all of your partnership over the last month putting this program together. Um, the staffs of both of these organizations really have been able to team up, and I think that um, in and of itself, that process has been worth um, all the hours we've been putting in. Tonight, we're focusing on the lives of people for whom weather, fair or foul, is always a concern, the fishing communities in coastal Mississippi and coastal Massachusetts. For lots of us, the sea means all kinds of things. Uh, it's a place to reflect, to find joy and inspiration and longing. To quote Herman Melville, yes, as everyone knows, meditation and water are wedded forever. And for millennia, people have turned to the sea, uh, especially these two bodies of water, the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic, for sustenance, creating livelihoods and culture from the ingenuity of indigenous communities to the waves of new immigrants who gravitated to the fishing industries to feed their families. Life on the water and on shore is forever changing, building off of traditions and wisdoms passed between generations. We're going to hear tonight uh, from members of uh, two of those families, but first it's really a great honor to welcome two scholars who lead cultural institutions that, with previous support from Mississippi Humanities Council and Mass Humanities, and especially the National Endowment for the Humanities, have created new avenues for the voices of fishing communities to be heard. 
We'll hear from them first to get a sense of the places where they live and work. So a great pleasure uh, to welcome to Miss Mass Laura Orleans, Executive Director of the New Bedford Fishing Heritage Center in New Bedford, Massachusetts, and Julian Rankin, Executive Director of the Walter Anderson Museum in Ocean Springs, Massachusetts. I'm gonna begin with you, Julian, and ask how the weather is down there for you. It's um, it's good, and, and actually I'm not even in Mississippi right now, so we, we won't necessarily reveal my location, but it, all, all it's to say is, you know, we're all peripatetic, um, culture seekers in this day and age, but certainly we're, we weren't expecting snow in Mississippi. And, um, and I know there's a lot of folks down there who are, who are dealing with power outages and um, hopefully, hopefully we're, we're used to hurricanes. So hopefully we can, uh, they can weather the storm, but really thrilled to be here with y'all. And I'm, I look forward to introducing a little bit about our institution as well and how these questions um, circulate around our work. Um, do you want me to just dive right in? Or, I mean, I'd, I'd be interested to hear sort of Laura, maybe we can have a little bit of a conversation and back and forth about our institutions. Um, so maybe I'll ask a question that I'm asked, asked you know, Laura and myself is, you know, about the water. And I, I'd be interested to learn, and hopefully we all are here, about the ways in which we have similarities at being coastal dwellers, but also how the, in, the um, unique geography and topography may actually be different. And so I wonder, Laura, how, how it influences you know, the work you do on, on the cultural space, uh, just that proximity to the water. Sure. Well, I think for myself, you know, had you asked me 25 years ago or had you, had you told me that I would be kind of spending my every waking hour thinking about the fishing community, I, I would have been dumbfounded because it was um, the furthest thing from my mind. But I moved to this area about 24 years ago and um, just became really fascinated with a community that felt that seemed to me not to really have much of a voice um, and to be really misrepresented often in the media particularly. Um, and so it just has become a passion of mine to figure out ways to kind of um, create space where people in the fishing community can share their own stories, preserve their history and where people who are outside of that community can find connection. And do you mind just uh, for my edification and for all of us, just introducing your institution and oh, I mean, yeah. how, how, how long you've been doing the work? Sure. So um, I, as I said, I came here about 24 years ago. The New Bedford Fishing Heritage Center is relatively new. We're about to celebrate our fifth anniversary at the end of June, um, but it's really an outgrowth of something that um, goes back much further. And so that um, when I came here, the, the, if, if anybody in the audience knows anything about New Bedford, my guess is that you know about Herman Melville and the whaling history, and that's certainly a rich part of our past, um, but it isn't the only story is what I usually say to people. And when I came here, I began to meet people who work on the port on the waterfront today in a variety of ways and um, was struck by the fact that people didn't really cross over the highway that bisects the town from its waterfront. Um, that wasn't always there, that, that came into being in the 1970s as part of urban renewal. Um, but it really did a job um, separating those who are on the waterfront from those who are not. And so at this point, it, it's kind of like you don't go down there in, unless you have a reason to, if you work there or your um, family to somebody who does. Uh, and not only that, but as I said, the media um, also really misrepresented things. And so I would open up the newspaper, the local newspaper, or turn the radio or television on and hear horrible things about people. And yet the people I was meeting were really fascinating, hardworking, resilient, resourceful, um, kind of a folklore stream, you know, very diverse community and um, lots of family traditions passed on from one generation to the next. And so it felt to me like a story that needed to be told. And so in 2003, I began sort of uh, with this idea that we should create a massive festival and people had no idea what I was talking about. I was thinking of the Smithsonian Festival. I think that was really my model. Um, but people were kind of like, oh, you mean like Ferris wheels, cotton candy? <laughs> I said, no, no, no. They're going to they're gonna be up on a stage talking about their lives and the things that matter to them. Oh, you mean like a conference? And I said, no, they're, you know, they're going to have tools and engines and, you know, the stuff that they use. And they said, like a trade show? And I said, no. <laughs> and so it kind of grew into this, this thing. And we took over three piers on the waterfront and it, um, the festival went for, I think, 15, 14 years. Um, but all the while, it was a two-day, I sometimes describe it as Brigadoon would rise up and then it would disappear again and people would go back to kind of forgetting we had a fishing industry unless a boat went down or 
you know, they read something nasty in the newspaper. And so we started to do a lot of year round things kind of quietly um, and eventually decided it was time to form a nonprofit and create a, an institution that would have a place to preserve the history and a year round presence in the community. And so that uh, happened in 2016 and um, here we are. <laughs> Tell That's me right. about, you know, you're, I think you come from a somewhat different institution. It's an art museum. Right, yeah, so the Walter Anderson Museum of Art in, in Ocean Springs, uh, for hopefully our Mississippi people know, know of it, um, he is this enigmatic, or was, he died in 1965, but probably most the most famous visual artist the Mississippi's ever produced, but he was also the most elusive and sort of hard to pin down. He was a nature-focused, um, not just artist, but philosopher and poet, and spent his entire life for the most part, aside from his, his travels where he would go um, abroad and come back home, he, he decided to stay in the Gulf Coast of Mississippi and, um, and, and really devote his, like his, the entirety of his, of his being to um, bringing people closer to nature. And so I think what's interesting when, when, when you're talking about how your institution approaches the unheard stories and the, um, the duty and obligation to reinterpret or perhaps interpret for the first time, some of these stories that either have gotten uh, pushed to the side or potentially misunderstood. And so I think Walter Anderson, the, the artist that we, we celebrate at our museum, opens up all these conversations for us about what does our, what does place mean really? Um, place being a, a container for, you know, all of our cultures, um, our literature, our music, our food. And it's funny because Walter Anderson has, you know, one, one of the the places he loved most was one of the barrier islands in, in the Mississippi Gulf Coast that floats out in the Gulf of Mexico. It's called Horn Island. And Horn Island is one of several wilderness islands. Again, it's this chain of barrier islands floating out there in the, in the sound in the Gulf. And he talked about it in, in this very transformative way. It was an Eden, a paradise for him. But he, he referenced the, the mystery of it. He was saying, you know, such a sky, such water, um, Horn Island was, was almost like a, the back of Moby Dick, the white whale. So he's, thought, he, he, he's a, a fascinating um, character because of the way that he imbues his, his whole identity with the, the folklore and the literature that he had been reading. And he, he really did, again, talking about the Melville-Moby Dick connection, think of this island as a living, breathing thing. And when depicting these um, landscapes and flora and fauna, his goal was to bring people in closer relationship with their own environments. And so when we try to do this, this work in a more contemporary space, that, that idea of just going outside or across the, you know, the borders of your pre preconceived notions or off the beaten path, et cetera, um, that's always part of our story and our museum's um, kind of positioning. But increasingly, it, it's, it's not just about um, the barriers that are physical, but the barriers that are more sociological, potentially, or cultural. I mean, in the same way that, you know, um, it's not always about the landscape of, um, you know, the, the dirt outside, but the landscape of, of the American imagination. So I think the more that we, because we have an artist who is kind of a cosmic thinker, and we're, our, we are situated at the, at the Gulf Coast, uh, you know, doorstep, which it's this. It's the American Sea, and that taken a, a, a kind of borrowing from Pulitzer Prize winner Jack Davis's book from a few years ago. He talks about the Gulf, the making of an American Sea. So I think it's really interesting to think about the American roots of certainly Massachusetts, um, and you know Mississippi's not um, has, has a different kind of colonial history and a different kind of American history than, than some other parts. But I think equally the the land and importantly the water. Um, is what defines our entire um, kind of focus. And so it's, yeah, it's coming from an art perspective, but I think it's an important, important for us all to, to really understand that the, the story is what underpins um, all of these things. So kind of to turn it back to you before we get into a little bit of these breakout sessions and start to, to have some discussion amongst ourselves. I'm curious to hear about the, the National Endowment for the Humanities work you did um, and, and are still doing, because that's also a connection between our two institutions and I think this being a humanities, of course, centered conversation, I might be interested to hear how, how y'all use that support from the NEH um, and maybe how that is doing something um, that needed to be done, but, had, but potentially hadn't been done. Because I know for our program, it was, it was definitely pushing us into a different, um, a different 
lens and a different lane than we had done in the past. I, I would agree. Um, and so the festival for most of its years was, um, I described it as an educational celebration. Um, and that's not to say that we didn't delve into more contentious material. Um, there was a narrative stage and there were discussions that dealt with issues around sustainability and labor and immigration and new immigrants and old immigrants and things like that. But it was not the center of the festival. People tended to gravitate more toward the music or to the scallop shucking contest or the cooking demonstrations. Um, the center has been, and I think it's an important place for people to feel a sense of pride in their, um, their work. I mean, I think we all want to be known um, and people who fish for a living are pretty mysterious because the fishing happens way offshore, at least in our port. Um, and they tend to be, there's a quiet pride, but they tend not to be very outspoken about what they do. And um, so anyway, that's one piece of it. Um, the NEH grant, the initial grant that we got, we actually have now have, we're on our third grant. We had a, um, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the grant program, but it was a digitizing grant that allowed us to begin sort of digitizing things that are now, and, and we've created a digital archive. Um, the grant that kind of set off where we are today was a grant, a planning grant to look at the history of organized labor on the New Bedford waterfront. Um, I had been hearing for many, many years about a bitter strike that happened in 1985. And every time I would try to probe, and this goes back, you know, 20 years, I would ask just a simple question and people would recoil and say, no, 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 that's, you know, it's too, I, I can't talk about that. And interestingly, when we opened the center, nobody knew that we had applied for a grant to do this study and people started coming in with their union books and their union um, flags and t-shirts and just stuff, artifacts. And they would say, I think this is an important part of our story. And, you know, I don't know if you want it, but, but I think it's important. And so it kind of gave us the sense that um, we we're on the right track. And so we did um, an extensive project trying to understand the various unions, every aspect of the waterfront had been unionized. Today, only the longshoremen who offload cargo um, are, have an active union in the port. Um, and things changed, you know, it was clearly a watershed moment that sort of final strike in 1985-86 and sense of community change. Um, and so we were gonna actually do an exhibit that focused exclusively on that. We have a very tiny space and what we realized is that that would be doing a disservice to the fishing community. And so the exhibit that we will be opening hopefully in about a month, um, we'll look, it, it'll still give an introduction to the workings of the fishing industry for somebody who knows nothing. It'll also look at immigration, um, both the older, more established immigrant groups and the newer immigrant groups. It'll look at the unions and the, um, the strike. It'll look at issues around sustainability, all packed within um, about 2000 square feet. So what we're doing is to use a ton of digital media and oral history excerpts. And so um, I'm very excited about finally bringing all of these voices that I've been hearing for 25 years um, to an audience uh, in a way that I don't think has been done before. Tell me about yours. <laughs> and I feel like we're no, that's running out of time too. No, I, th I think I, I can uh, I can do a good handoff from from that. Take that baton and and kind of uh, weave this together through through the work we've been doing and, and set us up for this breakout session. So, um, I think what you're saying though about the voices is is critical. Um, our our NEH project that we're finishing up now was was a digital humanities project, very uh, much in line with the kind of things we're doing right now, having a conversation uh, beyond uh, geographic borders and so forth. Um, but it was engaging all of these themes I alluded to, foodways, um, you know, literature, conservation and science and, and, and history, um, from the indigenous histories to, you know, the more contemporary um, kind of labor histories. And I just, because we are an art museum, I am going to just, show, I wasn't planning on just not a presentation by any means, but I do want to show um, just a couple artworks from Anderson um, to give a sense of you know, maybe kind of what the coast is. So this, you know, this is Anderson's self-portrait, him rowing out to Horn Island. And again, all, all of the, the motion, the movement um, of the sea is, I think, reflected by the motion, the movement on land by the people. And I think that, that's something that we in this NEH project and then even beyond that in our daily work are trying to do more and more of. It's because nature does not exist in a vacuum, just like humanity does not. Um, w Wendell Berry has a great quote that you know, um, humanity and, and the land are, are culturally wedded. So there's a, there's a role for, um, for obviously 
preserving nature and its kind of uh, totality, but also we have to understand that we cannot be separate from it. Um, so, you know, Anderson, just to give you a few more um, kind of notes about the Mississippi Gulf Coast, these are 1930s murals that were done as part of a federal program. I mean, you can see that there's oyster tonging happening and the nets that are pulling in, um, you know, shrimp. And, and this really was about the seafood capital of the world, which was what Biloxi, Mississippi, which is right near Ocean Springs here on the coast, um, is known for. So I just wanted to give you all a few. And, and when you mentioned labor, this is a, a pen and ink called oyster shuckers. And if you look at the history of, of coastal Mississippi and the seafood industry, you see that there were um, real issues with with labor, um, because specifically the child labor that was fueling that in the in the early 1900s. So all that's to say is like we we are um, very similar in our kind of humanity's understanding of, of what the institution should be doing in, in terms of prioritizing voices. We just come at it from a different perspective with you know with visual art as a, a mediator as a conversation starter. Um, so that's that, that's our story, and I think we have a good sense of, of yours too. So I, I look forward to seeing what the rest of the participants can can unearth as we um, as we break out and, and kind of circle back. So I'll hand it off to back to Brian and, and Caroline if, if y'all want to transition us. Sure, that that was fascinating, and both of you have such unique institutions, but also I think missions and, and subject matter. So thank you for that. Um, in a minute, we are going to go into the breakout rooms. Uh, you know, at this first uh, juncture, it is an opportunity to get to know the people in the other room. Um, but uh, as a way to, uh, to get to know each other better, we're putting into the chat uh, two questions to consider. Uh, one, um, knowing that water means different things to different people, what does the ocean mean to you? And second, what determines our relationships to the water? So those are your two questions. We'll be sending them into the breakout room along with you, um, but feel free to get to know each other and, and to ponder, um, again, your relationship with the ocean. We'll be back in about 15 minutes from that breakout room uh, to hear from our other guests. Thanks. So like Brian said, we're about to go into breakout rooms. Um, a notice on your screen is gonna pop up that says, go to breakout room or move to breakout room, click okay. And it's gonna virtually transport you into these breakout rooms with um, a couple other people. You'll be in there for about 15 minutes. Um, and also like Brian said, the questions are in the chat section. So make sure that you go ahead and open up the chat so that you can see those questions. Um, and we will see you, um, we'll, some of us will still be in the main room. So if you have any trouble, um, you can come back into the main room uh, and, we will, and we will get it sorted out and get you back into the breakout room. So we'll see all of y'all in about 15 minutes. We hope that you had a great uh, first breakout session. Don't worry, uh, we will be back in those same breakout rooms shortly. So you'll still have more time to talk with the people that you were in that room with. Um, but we hope that y'all had great conversations. We'd love to hear um, some of your takeaways. So please feel free to drop some of your thoughts and, and what you talked about into the chat um, so that other people can see and we can all kind of get a sense um, for, for the conversations that y'all had. I'm gonna hand it back over to Brian now, who's gonna introduce the next um, portion of our program. Thanks, Caroline. And I'll be turning it over uh, to Laura and Julian in a minute to welcome in uh, our next guest, uh, Bill Blount, who is the captain and owner of the fishing festival, vessel uh, Ruthie B, which he designed and built in the 1970s. He's been fishing for over 50 years uh, and was the last offshore commercial fisherman on Nantucket Island uh, before moving to New Bedford in 2018. And Sue Wynn is the owner of La Bakery in East Biloxi. She was born in San Diego to Vietnamese immigrants who moved to Biloxi um, when she was still a girl. She grew up in kitchens, uh, seafood and fish is certainly a part of her life as well. So we're glad to be able to have the opportunity to listen to the two of them um, from these two very different places, talk about what the ocean and fishing has meant in their lives. And uh, we're lucky to have Julian and Laura here to, I think, help guide that conversation. So Laura, I'm gonna turn things over to you. Okay, great. Well, I'm gonna start um, by asking Bill a question, which I don't know the answer to. I've known Bill for quite a while now. Um, and I, I know that the Blount family is known um, perhaps best for shipbuilding. Uh, your father has, or had, he's, he's no longer, but your sisters are still running uh, Blount Marine, which is actually in Rhode Island, our neighboring state. 
Uh, I know you did some work in your father's shipyard, including designing and building the Ruthie B, but ultimately you chose to make a living um, as a commercial fisherman at sea. What, what made you decide to go to sea? Well, I, I've, I always enjoyed fishing. Uh, when I was a little boy, when I came home from school, uh, uh, the first thing I did is I would go and get my little hand line and I would go uh, bum a broken cohog or clam off of uh, one of the, the fish markets and I'd go fishing every single day, you know, and then, then but then when, um, and when I was seven, I began commercial fishing. My father would go built a boat for himself and then we went sword fishing and it was hand harpoon sword fishing. It was really exciting. It was whaling on the half scale. And uh, as a boy at uh, seven years old, I began at eight years old, they always go out in a dory and what had happened is they would harpoon a swordfish uh, and then he would take maybe a, a couple hundred fathoms of rope and then he would take off with a keg and they would they'd bring up and put a, a, a 19 foot dory on, on them with a, one or two guys. And then they'd go for an Nantuck sleigh ride. And it was an exciting thing. And these were the, this was in the mid fifties, you know, it's before the days of modern electronics. And uh, my father would leave me for five hours when I was 12 and then come back and find me 40 miles offshore without any modern electronics. I, uh, I, I got a couple swordfish in no in in the early 2000s, and I put a man out on the dory because it, it's much easier to play him out. I didn't. I wouldn't. I didn't. I stayed right with the guy because I didn't want to lose him. I was scared. But but anyway. Um, so anyway, when when I got out of the service, uh, I my dad and I are like, and so I was. Yeah, I kind of butted heads with him, and I could see it just wouldn't really work to to work for him. So I decided to do the thing that I just loved the most. And so I decided to go commercial fishing. And I asked him, you know, he, he said, well, you can build a boat in the shipyard here. And so I started making plans. And then he just said, well, that's going to cost too much. You're going to have to go and, and go find one. And he said, I'll help you buy one. So anyway, so I started in Stonington, Connecticut, and I went all the way to Corpus Christi, Texas, looking for, uh, for a, a reasonable boat that I could find. And I ended up in Gulfport, Mississippi, and I bought a 65-foot shrimp boat from Billy Womack in Gulfport, Mississippi, and in the September of 1970, I, I sailed it back to, to Rhode Island and outfitted it. First, I went clamming, and then I did what I switched over to what I really wanted to do. I went ground fishing, and I've been ground fishing ever since. So we did not plan that. <laughs> and I'll just say that it I know when I, when I saw they were from from Gulf from Mid Biloxi, Gulfport is right next to you. So I say it's interesting, interesting how we're all connected. It is, and you know, and tonight, just lo and behold, we I had Gulf Coast shrimp for dinner. So <laughs> you know, it, just, it doesn't take well, long good. when you talk coastal communities to find the common threads. You know, it really doesn't. Right. Um, I don't know if we want to go back and forth this quickly, or should I ask a, sort of some more questions about. Well, what do you I, think? I, I think it's a good uh, a good time to, yeah. to ask, ask Sue similarly, Great. you know, you're on the the food service side of this um, kind of ecosystem that involves farmers and fisher folk, you know, you're serving the food in the kitchen, um, but your parents also came to Biloxi and the reason you're in Biloxi is because they were going to be a part of the seafood industry too. Um, yeah, so just, so yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so I was telling uh, in the breakout session before, uh, when I think of when you said, you know, what does water mean to you? Uh, you know, becoming, you know, obviously first generation, you know, uh, Vietnamese here, uh, my parents were immigrants. Well, what brought us over here? Obviously the water, you know, uh, to cross over, to make it over, you know, as refugees, uh, to make it over to a new country. Uh, my parents, uh, we settled in San Diego, which is, you know, right there on the water as well. Uh, we have always um, just enjoyed that coastal life, you know, fishing and, you know, I remember as a kid, my whole family went to uh, Disneyland and I was the only kid that decided they were going to go fishing with my grandmother and my uncles. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I didn't go to Disneyland. They all went. I, I went fishing. And so, but the funny story is my parents wanted to see America. So they crossed, you know, they went on Interstate 8 that connected to um, Interstate 10 and they stopped off in different cities, you know, or states and checked out everything all the way to Florida. So when they stopped in um, Biloxi, Mississippi, it's because they had friends 
that um, had established themselves here in the shrimping industry. Um, I think my dad was here for a day and fell in love with this coastal community, the life, you know, the, the pace of life, um, the climate. Uh, he just loved everything about it, that small town charm. Um, so they came back to San Diego, uprooted the whole family and told us we were moving to Biloxi, Mississippi. And of course, as kids, we're like, what's the lure? They're like, you're going to be about three blocks away from the ocean, you know, the, the water, you know. They didn't tell us the Gulf of Mexico was completely different from the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> but, um, you know, I literally grew up about a few blocks away from, you know, the water right there by the beach. Uh, we were two blocks away from the local fishing uh, pier. You know, so when, I, when you were talking about um, growing up and uh, not having electronics, I do remember literally getting a five gallon bucket, a fishing pole, and then going down buying a few dollars worth of bait at the, the corner of the bait shop right there. And um, we'd be so proud to catch dinner, you know, come home and have my mom and dad cook it. And, um, you know, and I was very lucky to have the neighbors that we have because my neighbors were the um, iconic, and when I say iconic restaurateurs of uh, down here in Biloxi. When people talk about, you know, stories about different places, I grew up on the point and I was very uh, lucky to have neighbors that were very um, welcoming and learn, you know, teaching us how to make gumbo and jambalaya. In return, my parents were making egg rolls and fried rice and teach, you know, as far as like this cultural fusion and our, our um, I guess you would say the, the common language would be food, you know, for sure. And that was, you know, what brought us there is the seafood industry down here, for sure. Love it. Well, yeah, Laurie, let's let's take let's kick it back to you. And and just to say for people who don't haven't been to Biloxi is, you know, Sue, the baked goods are and everything is is a uh, kind of a, a top class. But I guess the, the the thing that's so interesting about it is the is the cultural fusion. So as I mentioned earlier, you know, we're so close to New Orleans. You know, we also have this kind of mobile to the east. Um, we've got. The, the the sea, um, all these different ethnic uh, fishing communities have come over the past 120 years. Um, so what you get in a, in a place like the bakery is, you know, uh, a bon mi, which is essentially a po' boy, which is playing with, you know, the what the local flavor is for, um, you know, spices and, and proteins, but then techniques and accoutrements might be uh, kind of cilantro and things from Vietnam. And so that, that that's, I think, the, the, the example that we're um, hopefully talking about is that all of these different cultural communities and geographies um, can overlay on each other. And I mean, to use kind of something Anderson said, you know, it, it's a, a third thing is created. You have nature and humanity, um, art, whether it be food or a story, um, you know, a poem, it's a third thing, an altogether new thing that has roots in the, the source material. And so I think Sue's food is a great way to about that. Um, but also just this conversation we're having now is a third thing that is emerging from, from two well, different coasts. Julian, if you really think about it, as far as like with Vietnam being colonized by the French, we had a lot of French influence. And I guess that's where like, even like where I live with French bread, you know, so for us to come down here and then, you know, obviously there's a lot of French influence down here in the Gulf, you know, in the South, you know, in Mississippi, like, like you were saying, going into like New Louisiana, uh, you know, our common ground was, hey, we have this bread, you know, as the carrier, if you think about it, you know, so between all the different cultures here, we had a common bread. Now it's what you do with that bread is what made it unique. And I feel like, you know, like we were saying, like, why is the bakery so like inclusive with different cultures? Because any day that you come in here, you see so many different types of people that come in here for one common product, you know, which, like I said, so whether you put shrimp on it, fish or, you know, uh, roast pork, <laughs> you know, I think that's kind of where we're, you know, like we were saying, like what, what bloomed from, you know, this region in that sense, you know. Yep. So Bill, I'm, I'm going to ask you a little bit, just because I think for most people, we don't, we don't have a, an idea of what your day-to-day -day life is like when you're at sea. Can you just give us a sort of snapshot? Um, how long is a typical trip? How many people on the crew? Those kinds sure. of just general things. Sure. Well, w what I do is called dragging. And so I tow uh, a net behind the boat and um, I haul it back um, 
every either two to five hours and we empty it out and then set it back out again. And while we're towing it, then we sort through and the fish that, that we've caught and we uh, put, throw away the, we call it the trash, the stuff that's not worth anything. Anything's worth something, we'd save it. Um, some stuff has to be washed a certain way. Some stuff had like a monkfish, we got to cut the tails off, the heads, uh, the cod and haddock have to be uh, gutted uh, and, and then bled and gutted and washed. Um, and then we put it down and, and hopefully we have a little time to rest and then we haul back again and we just keep doing that. It's like a factory production until we have a trip. I'm 75 and so, uh, and we've gone through some heavy regula regulations. So um, I've uh, ended up, I go like on a three to five day trip, but most guys are doing a seven day trip. And I have like one crewman with me and we, and I don't, I'm being 75, I don't push it, but uh, most guys would, would, would have a four to a seven man crew. And um, we would, uh, we, we, we would, what we do is we, we go by watches. So you might be, uh, uh, it's usually every 12 hours, it's like nine and three or eight and four. So that would be eight hours you'd be on, four hours you'd be off, or nine hours you're on, or three hours you're off. Or sometimes if you're really catching a lot of fish, they call it breaking watches, which you just go 24 hours straight, labor right straight to, to you get, get the fish down. You got to get, the object is we're, we're, we want a good quality product. So we've got to, you know, you want to leave it on deck, we're going to take care of it as quickly as possible and get it on ice. So when Let me ask you a little bit about, let's, let's go back to the food topic. Tell okay. me a little bit about what, what you guys eat when you're at sea and who does Okay, well, um, it's, it's changed. We, we, used to, we used to have like a six to eight or even bigger cruise than that. So uh, when we did that, there would be one guy who might just be the cook. And in the old days, they would have... Uh, three full meals a day. Now the guys are doing a lot of work. I can remember I started a little dragging when I was, I did a couple summers in like 62, 63. And um, there were five men on deck and the captain was in the wheelhouse. And in 20 hours, we put down 100,000 pounds of fish. Another trip I was on uh, a little bit later, 1970, uh, we landed in Boston with 215,000 pounds of fish. So you, we're doing a lot of heavy labor. So uh, uh, in the old days, if I can remember um, for breakfast, you would have, uh, and, and this is not really what the guys would do today, but in the old days when they're doing really a lot of heavy labor, um, they, they would have uh, eggs, uh, uh, cereal, uh, toast, bacon, sausage, pies. Um, it was on a Norwegian boat, so they'd have Stavanger eggs, they'd have smoked mackerel, they'd have... Um, all kinds of toast, donuts. That would just be breakfast, <laughs> and and then uh, lunch would they they would have a ham, ham uh, maybe uh, uh, baked uh, sweet potatoes, uh, vegetable salad, um, and pies and cakes and everything. That would be lunch. Dinner they'd have a full turkey dinner with everything, all the works, you know, and 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 a dessert as well. And so you do tremendous meals you were eating. You know, I can uh, we used to, and then the plates. Um, because of the heavy weather, you don't have a flat plate because when you roll the peas, it go everywhere. So it's like a, like a big bowl. And I can remember um, uh, I ate three, and the bowl was over 12 inches in diameter, okay? And I remember having, uh, for one meal, a meal, and there would be no problem. I had three bowls of three plates of spaghetti and two plates of salad. <laughs> <laughs> just ate a tremendous amount. but you're doing all this heavy physical labor now it's kind of changed we've had a lot of really strict regulations we're cut back on how much we're all to catch and everything and so um we've in order to you get paid on a percentage basis so uh, and they call it a share system it's age-old system came came from the vikings um and it's you, you we, my men make a percentage of with the gross or the net that the boat the boat uh catches or they call it the gross stock the amount of money that they they catch and uh so in order to make the money what we've done and because we're not allowed to catch as much fish anymore is that we've cut the cruise down in order to do that uh we're trying to uh save time and effort so usually now the captain not only runs a boat but he also cooks the meals 
And, and so I'm the cook on board the boat. And uh, <laughs> you learn to cook uh, easy meals. They got to be good. It's got to be a good meal because if the guys, if they're not making money and, and, and the food is terrible, you're in trouble. You're going home. <laughs> so you, you want at least, at least if they're, if they're, if, if they're not making money, then at least they'd be happy they're getting good food to eat. So it's got to be a really good meal, but it's got to be one that you can, you can cook and fix. Mike, I'm working on deck. So I got to run in, set this thing up and then run back out. And if, well, and while it's cooking, I may come in 10 minutes later, make sure it's okay, go back and forth. And so it's gotta be a meal that you can fix like that. It can't be a meal that you gotta stand over and watch all the time. But, but, but you learn, you have your standard meals. I have maybe 10 standard meals that I have. And, 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 I, and I like to play around. I enjoy cooking anyway. So if I have time, I'll do special things and like that. But, uh, but anyway, um, but, but I guess that's, uh, Give you an idea anyway that's on on the meals oh, that we great. have I, I just have to ask sue a quick question i'm looking at your hyphenated name are you married to somebody from norway yes that's what i was gonna say <laughs> i was like that is so funny we've been talking about you know uh my husband's nordic uh background we like to say our son is scandinavian <laughs> <laughs> And so he gets a kick. He gets a kick about having Viking blood in him for sure. My seven-year-old son. So he's he's a trip. We yes. have a very large Norwegian community um, in right. the next town over called Fairhaven, um, but it's right. all the same port. And so Norwegians are particularly known uh, nowadays for the, their scalloping, um, for the right. being involved in the scalloping. And, and, I, and I'm part Norwegian too. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> so, well, uh, I was. I wanted to ask a, a question for both of y'all. Um, while y'all were talking, I was, it was, I was thinking a little bit about, you know, how, how y'all both share this entrepreneurial spirit. You have to, if you're a boat captain or a business owner. Um, and I think there's something interesting to, to talk about there to tease out, you know, potentially what is it about the water um, or living on the coast? Maybe, maybe that inspires people to kind of take a risk um, because so many, you know, jobs that have to do with going out and, and catching things from the sea um, I mean, these are ones where you just kind of, you got to go get it, you know, and, and, um, and I think also, though, that with the, the seafood industry, specifically like in Biloxi, you, if you go back and look over time, again, you, you see child labor in the turn of the 20th century, and you, you see all these different immigrant groups coming in, um, many of them, all of them, you know, working to pass something down to the next generation, but also these are big systems, and of course, there's always inequity in those, but there's something Again, um, this, this idea of adventure that the water holds um, and, and also this idea of being kind of the captain of your own destiny, um, literally or figuratively. I just wonder, do y'all have any, is, are you able to dissect your, um, your passion for doing what you do, whether it be a, you know, cooking, owning a bakery, being a small business owner, a community a flagship business owner versus being a, a boat captain, having to to be the chef, to be the captain, to go out there and and basically be like a magician to pull something from the dark water that's going to feed people and make you money. I mean, these are very high wire acts, um, but they also are very American. Again, back to this idea of the old man in the sea, or you know, um, or kind of Melville's idea of destiny. Do y'all do y'all think about the water, the coast? Does that does that does that ingredient have anything to do with the way that y'all pursue your own? Um, careers? I, 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 let me, as far as like having this, um, uh, this, uh, in a connection to water, you know, I think like we were saying, like symbolically, you know, when you think about like the potential of what we have here in the Gulf uh, or, you know, any body of water, uh, you know, obviously you can sustain from it, you know, you can, uh, you know, live from this water, you can, you know, that's what feeds you. But then, you know, you, you have this idea of where water can be very calming, but is very disruptive as well, you know, destructive as well. Uh, you think about cycles, you know, how cyclical things are. And then you think about potential, you know, and you were saying like, you know, does that guide you in a, in a sense of like captain of your ship? Absolutely. I think um, living on the coast, uh, there is a sense of uh, tranquility when you do drive and you, you just take that moment to look at the water and you realize nature's uh, beauty as well as the, the, the force behind it, you know, and it's unexplainable, but you just feel it in your soul in a certain way. And, and I could not even imagine being landlocked, you know, in that, you know, not around water, you know. Um, even when my grandmother, uh, you know, obviously whenever, she, you know, she's a refugee, 
you know, and she came over to this country, you know, thinking about my grandmother who was born in what, 1912 and all the things that she saw, you know, and technology and things, you know, for her, uh, the water has always been our connection, you know? So uh, like I said, I remember going fishing with my grandmother versus going to Disneyland, you know? And even when she passed, you know, her whole thing was like, it doesn't matter where she's buried or, you know, ashes or whatnot. She's like, as long as you're around a body of water, you would be, you know, you're, you're there together. And I'm like, you think about it from, you know, rainwater to everything. I think that's what connects us for sure. There's, there's a, just a feeling of um, empowerment in that sense too, you know? I love that. Bill, what well, would you I, say to that? Well, I, I, and, and I think there's a, there's a, something about being a fisherman that um, it's, it's adventuresome. It's, uh, it's uh, dangerous. It, it's, uh, it has a romance to it. You know, uh, it, it's exciting. Um, and um, it's just, uh, be careful what I say here, but it's, it's something that a, a man can really get into and and uh and, and so much so that very soon and i think this is a question that that laura had later on here but i think but that um it, it what happens with fishermen is that uh the rather than viewing fishing as their job they view it as their identity and right. so uh we you know so uh it's really different and then when and when uh fishing began we had, and ground fishing began to uh struggle uh, a number of years ago and the government decided well we'll just retrain these all these guys and they'll go and do something else and it was a total failure and it ended up in being a lot of broken broken marriages and and the guys the guys just couldn't get out of it because they just couldn't retrain the men once they had that uh fishing uh into them it was their identity and so they, they were unable to take them out of it and um and 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 I and that's why I'm into it. I mean, I I mean a lot of some some trips are I I I you know did not a couple of times I didn't think I was coming home, but I did, so I'm still here. But but uh, so it is real dangerous, and sometimes you don't make any money, but sometimes you do well. But it's the excitement of of it, it's the romance of it, it's the it's just really cool. It's just really neat, and and so I I really enjoy it. And it's not for everybody, obviously, but but it's just a. a I, it's just a real exciting thing. And I have tons of stories. Stories I have. And I may not always have money, but I got stories. So I wish we had more time for the stories. Yeah. yeah. So I was, I uh, you did kind of preempt me, but I'm curious, Sue, you know, that um, we, we are, our exhibit that I was speaking about at the beginning is called More Than a Job. And it really does come from so many conversations with people in the fishing community, not just fishermen, but pretty much anybody who works in that industry talks about their work as it's, it's a culture, it's a way of life. Um, sometimes they speak about it as an art form. I'm curious, I, I'm thinking as a baker, that there might be something um, for you as well. I mean, I, bake, baking is, you, you have to give it your all and there is artistry in it. Absolutely, to... there's a, I like to say a lot of blood, sweat and tears, a whole lot of dough, but not a lot of money. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it is something that I need uh, in, in the sense of, uh, you know, there is something very, um, mm -hmm. I don't know, primitive, the, the fact that you work with your hands, the fact that you take raw ingredients and you transform it into something that people love or that they're, you know, it's a part of, um, and I say even at the bakery, we are a part of every celebration, coming into life, a wedding, you know, all these things, you know, all these aspects of, you know, people's livelihood and even at a funeral, you know. So, I mean, when I think about like the interaction that I have with people just based on something that I created and it, it is a it's a it's a very hard feeling to uh, pinpoint to, you know, explain, but it is it's a pretty amazing feeling for sure. And uh I was saying as far as like, I really respect the fact as far as like, you know, Mr. Bill, as far as even like his, when we say his livelihood, but his way of life, um, I don't, you know, he said it's not for everyone, you know, and I could see that, you know, but I think if people had a taste of that, they could see why for sure. You know, there's, there's something so beautiful in the fact of, you know, harvesting, you know, from the sea, you know, for what the earth gave us, you know, in that sense. And that's, that's pretty amazing for sure. I think something too that that Sue and, and Bill are both talking about is this idea of you know what what you do with your hands um, 
again, uh, this connection to like our, our ancient selves, if we think about kind of the oceans and things, but you know, I hadn't thought about it, but you know, a baker's hands, I don't know if, I don't know if you're calloused or not, but you, your hands are definitely yes. strong. Yes, there you go. <laughs> and it's probably not that dissimilar from having to hold, you know, to, to, to be, if you're a sailor, you know, you're, you're constantly dealing with ropes and I mean, there's something very, um, salient to me about about what what can be done with your hands and also just the physical exertion um, and not not to kind of throw any more Walter Anderson quotes in there but our, the artist Walter Anderson would talk about when he would go out to Horn Island and he would row rather than take a motorboat because he wanted this perspective shift to happen where he would transition from the mainland to the island but he would talk about because hurricanes of course the storms that he would go through he said you know it was like he was in conflict with a demon but it wasn't necessarily an evil demon. It was just this this force of nature exactly. that would, would 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 allow him to reach the island. But it must be through the uttermost expenditure of strength and endurance. And so I think that that to me is really um, what I'm hearing. A connection I hadn't thought about before. But just the the fact that both of y'all make things with the not just the raw materials of the ingredient, but also the raw materials of what you have on your person. You know, your hands and your um, your passion and your grit. So I think that's something that's really interesting and I think is very much tied to coastal people. Well, one thing I really, really enjoy doing is producing a good quality product. And so I want my fish to be the best. And usually on auction, I have a very good reputation, but I really take joy in producing a really good, high quality product seafood. And, and I, I really enjoy doing that. And he is a good baker, too, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a good I fisherman. Will, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's I know Caroline we have, here. Oh, go, go ahead, ahead, Julian. I was going to say, I know we, we could talk forever, but I wanted to, we are on a, um, we did hit that magic, magic number there if, if you wanted to transition. Yeah, I hate to even interrupt this conversation, and I'm sorry that I'm now coming to y'all as the uh, as the Wizard of Oz, but my power just went out, so I'm joining everybody without a camera. Um, so I, I wanted to say thank you to Sue and Bill um, for sharing those stories with us. Um, it's so fascinating to hear about these experiences and, and to kind of see how defining water can be in two such seemingly different places, right? Um, and that's, I think, why this topic was initially so interesting to us as we were planning the program, um, that despite different geographies, there's so many common threads about water, um, you know, like that creativity and the ownership and working with your hands that, um, that we wanna explore a little bit more. And I think we also want to look towards the future a little as well, um, so that we can kind of leave thinking about what happens now and, and, and why these coastal communities are important. And so in just a moment, we're gonna go back into those same breakout groups um, that we were in earlier to build on what we've heard from Sue and Bill. Um, but I'll go ahead and give you a list of the questions now and we're about to put them in the chat as well. But how one is how do coastal communities serve as connecting points? Um, and then what are some challenges that, challenges that are facing coastal communities? And then, you know, looking forward as environments and economies are changing, how do we sustain these coastal communities? The people, the economies, the culture, all of it. Um, so like I said, we're gonna drop those in the chat and in just a moment, we're gonna put y'all back into the same breakout rooms. Uh, the little uh, notice will pop up on your screen again that says go to breakout room, just click okay or go and it will zoom y'all into these um, rooms and then we'll gather back here in about 15 minutes to close out. So I think almost everyone is back. Um, I know we're dropping in a survey uh, to get feedback on on this uh, program. We've been doing these now uh, for a while, but this one um, really struck me as just a real inside look at people's actual lives and, and how their families um, have uh, evolved and the way that the land, or in this case, the water really shapes, you know, how you feel about um, the world and, and, and how you feel about your own power in the world. And I think that's something that Julian brought out there a lot. Um, Caroline, uh, as always, um, fantastic to work with you on this, but um, any, any thoughts you have here as we, as we start to wrap up? Um, yeah, I'll just say thank you to everybody who participated in tonight's program. Um, as you can tell, Mississippi is touch and go right now in terms of 
of power and internet and everything. So thank you to all of our Mississippi attendees. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I wanna say it was such an intriguing program about coastal communities and water and the people who come from them. Um, so thank you to our panelists, to Laura, to Julian, uh, to Sue and to Bill for sharing those thoughts and, and getting us thinking about, you know, how we value coastal communities and, and kind of what our personal relationships are to the water. Um, and thanks again to Brian and to Mass Humanities for the partnership. Always a pleasure to work with y'all. And this is now our third of six, so we're at the halfway point. Um, so Brian, if you kind of want to talk about what's coming next. Um, yeah. Yeah, so, um, and, and I wanted to also just recommend, you know, one thing about the internet is you can stay involved with these institutions too. So, you know, make sure you look up and follow the Walter Anderson Museum of Art and the New Bedford Fishing Heritage Center, because as you can tell, they really do innovative work that I think brings up um, a lot of different stories and issues for us to think about through that work. We uh, will be back on March 18th, and we are working to bring together poet laureates from both of these states. So in uh, Mississippi, you have a state poet laureate, um, and I think we're also going to hear from some young voices um, from Mississippi. Similarly, here in Massachusetts, we have a few poet laureates for different cities, as well as some youth poet laureates for those cities, too. So we should have all the specifics um, wrapped up very quickly, and when we send out the link to the video for this event, um, we'll also be able to include that. But again, it's March 18th. Um, we've got a few more of these on, in, in, in the works right now, but I think that um, this is a great time uh, in America to look to poetry um, and to ask about its place in public life. Uh, again, for everybody in Mississippi, um, we do hope uh, that things warm up soon and that you're able to get through um, this really, really challenging few days that seem to be um, stretching out. So I'm glad to see Caroline is back. Um, and I hope that that's the case for the rest of the evening for you too, Caroline. And thanks for everybody who joined in these uh, breakout rooms and participated in conversations. You know, the point of this project is really to bring together great thinkers. And all of you are included in that list of great thinkers. And it's nice to know that people from Mississippi and Massachusetts are so friendly and curious about one another and able to really engage in some of these really fun conversations like the one I was in tonight. So thanks everyone. We will uh, talk to you soon. Uh, and uh, thanks for keeping the humanities in your lives in Massachusetts and Mississippi.